Welcome and thank you for tuning in. You're listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. I'm Daniel Davis. How many of us have watched the movie Cinderella or perhaps Sleeping Beauty? Or many of us like to tune in to things such as The Bachelor or The Bachelorette. There's that one dangling prize that we see within these particular shows or movies that tell us that once we find that special someone, there's a happily ever after. But what happens when we're on that road and that happily ever after dissipates? What do we do next? After all, that was a myth that we bought into and it disappeared on us, and now we're stuck wondering whether it really exists. On the program today, we're going to be joined with author Lisa Marie Jenkins. Her book is Wake Up Beauty. It's not about the prince. We're going to be talking about exploring that myth and what we can learn when we can decide we can evolve without that happily ever after myth. I'd like to welcome to the Beyond 50 radio program today our guest, Lisa Marie Jenkins. Lisa, thank you for joining us here on the program today. Hi, Daniel. Thank you. Happy to be here. I've always gotten a kick out of this because I wonder how all this ever really started where we bought into the idea of happily ever after. Can you kind of trace when all this happened? Oh, I think there's many origins, actually. I think for for women it 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 goes back to ancient times when we literally needed a man physically for for survival. We needed his strength. Um, we needed his power in order to survive some of the harshness of life. Um, so literally it were our, our physical survival depended on having a mate, and that's part of it. And then I think in modern society you can trace it more back to, we've, especially in Western culture, we've been so geared to look outside of ourselves for contentment and happiness. And so the romantic relationship is, is really an easy one to fall into. Because we're, there's everything in our society, every, every commercial, every movie. Um, our friends were, were taught to grow up and get married and have a family, and, and that will give us our holy grail. I think it's amazing when you consider that after World War II uh, that women were basically forced back into the homes to take on what was the Ozzy and Harriet nuclear family yeah. era. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, it's so funny you say that, Daniel. it frustrated a lot of women, you know, to realize, you know, I'm out there doing my own thing. Now I've got to go back and I've got to deal with appliances and keeping my man happy <laughs> as he goes to work. What kind of nonsense is that? You know what, that's so interesting you bring that up because I was just watching a documentary last night. From It was called World War II in HD, and, and they covered quite a bit about the women that really stepped up. And my mom was 18 to about 20 during the war, and she was actually worked as a welder during World War II. And yet, here's, here's somebody totally stepping in a, up in a man's role, absent of the men, and then my, my mom couldn't have been more of not feeling whole or complete unless she had a, a partner or a spouse next to her. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's interesting, too, because after your father, or when her father died, that her mother tried scrambling around to find what was a replacement husband, so to speak. Yeah, and, no, that was my mother. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> my exactly. My father died. And, you know, and it's interesting because the fact is is there was an imprint happening there that she was learning the fact that, you know, hey, you know, I can't survive without someone. You know, I, I can't step up and do my own thing. And it's pretty interesting how you see people become, you know, needy through those imprints, you know, and trying to find that particular thing that until they do, they're going to be empty. They're not whole. And yeah. sometimes I get a kick out of the idea I have found my soulmate and the things that we buy into in the illusions of love. Well, the, there's two things there, right? First of all, a soulmate, and my belief in a soulmate is we don't have, quote, just one, and, and often <laughs> our soulmate isn't somebody meant to have true long-term partnership. A soulmate is just somebody that's meant to rock our world and shake us up to awaken to ourselves, um, which is really ultimately the goal of the romantic relationship, to foster um, you know, more conscious awakening to ourselves and our own passion and purpose and beauty, and that's what it's all about. But so in the imprinting happens, it's been going on for generations and generations as long as you can go back. And so when my mother felt I'm not complete or whole or good enough without a man after my father died, for me, I, I adopted that imprinted on me as a child as we're not as good as other people because we don't have a dad. We don't have a patriarch. Therefore, we are less than everybody else in the world. Mm-hmm. And then as I became an adult, that translated into I'm not okay or whole without a partner, a spouse, a boyfriend. 
uh, so my book is really about, part of my book is about the journey of healing that and, and really realizing that nothing outside of you is ever going to bring you true fulfillment and that it's about the journey inward that brings you that mm-hmm. and waking up your own passion and purpose. And so, Daniel, the, the, the title actually, Wake Up Beauty, It's Not About the Prince, it comes from uh, somebody I was working with years ago and she said, honey, don't you know the biggest fattest lie we've ever been told as young young girls is that when the prince kiss Sleeping Beauty, she didn't wake up. She didn't wake up at all. She went to sleep. She went to sleep when the prince kissed her because she went to sleep on her own passion and purpose and worth because she believed romantic love was going to provide that to her. Now, it's fascinating because you conduct workshops, you know, for things such as Fortune 500 companies. Uh, They include Google, Xerox, Cisco, and the like. And I wonder, you know, as you do this, what are men's attitudes about something like this? You know, the women rising and actually claiming their personal power. So uh, that's that's the next step that really has to be addressed because you're hearing, I'm sure every if, if you listen to anything, you're hearing about this huge women's movement that's happening at all levels. You, every time you turn around, you hear about another women's group, another women's empowerment organization, another women's conference, et cetera. And so we're at the point where it's got to stop happening in a vacuum because this isn't about the old 70s, angry, uh, we need equality type of thing because we've moved past that. It's um, It's about balance. For me, it's about the masculine and feminine strengths, and we've been living in a world that's really dictated by the masculine. And when I say masculine, I don't necessarily mean men only because there's certainly women that take a very masculine approach to life. But... It's masculine, meaning competitive, linear, analytical, logical, resilience, very just decisive, take action. And when you look at the feminine characteristics, they're more collaborative, intuitive, creative, um, caring about the greater good, compassion, and empathy. And so we're, we're missing that. We're way out of balance in our, in our political systems and our business organizations where we haven't we haven't created a balance, but women have, and this is where the work comes in, is, is women have are now 50% of the workforce, but yet we hold on average only about 14% of any type of leadership role. And so women have often, what I find with women is they either feel like they've got to do it like a guy, which for most women that's not authentic, so they don't want to approach leadership that way, and they end up dropping out, or women focus really hard on being liked over being heard, and, and that comes from it's not been safe for women up until more modern times to, to defend themselves, to speak up, and to speak up differently. Because if you notice in our history, whenever there's a really powerful woman that comes into surface in business or in, in, in any arena, actually, she's really harshly criticized. Mm-hmm. For the same thing a guy does when he's successful, he's revered. When a woman does it, she's, she's not so nice. Mm-hmm. She's kind of a bitch. She's not trustworthy. She's out for herself. So, so women tend to um, play small, and they avoid putting themselves in the arena to avoid that, that criticism. Mm-hmm. You know, I was just thinking as you were describing that about an author that I had on the program some time ago, and she is very well known for writing westerns. Mm-hmm. And it's pretty amazing, a woman that actually writes westerns, usually <laughs> from a man's perspective. But I really enjoyed having her on the program because she writes the western from the perspective of the woman. You know, and immediately I, I began to understand that, you know, a woman's role back in the Wild West was probably way tougher than the gunslinger or the settler by a long shot. I mean, after all, who was keeping his clothes clean and the kids in line and basically, you know, the food on the Run table, the you know, without electricity for crying out loud. <laughs> yeah, that's why they didn't live much past their 40s, right? You know, and then you <laughs> consider, a harsh life. Right, and you consider some of the women that actually stepped up during a time where there was a lot of chaos and a lot of disorder, and you realize there was a lot. They were very hardy, and I think you put those women in this world today and yeah, there'll be some people getting the boot, I think. <laughs> well, I, I think those women are in the world today, but we've we've not found our voice, our right. authentic voice. And and I, you know, you asked me earlier on about you know the men, and I think it's about leveraging women to bring more of these feminine characteristics because in any kind of diversity of thought, you have greater pro, you know problem solving skills, and that leads to greater creativity and ultimately better you know greater success in whatever you're you're doing. But for men, I think there's a couple things going on. I think, number one, because of 
women can provide for themselves. They don't need a man for physical safety. They don't need him for financial reasons. Like the, the man's role for so long was to be protector provider. And so I think a lot of men are struggling with, well, who am I? What's my role as a man? If I don't play protector and provider to you, then I'm not needed and I don't really know who I am. And so, you know, it's a little bit scary for some men about this, this women's empowerment when it's really about healing and transforming and creating balance. But I think that men can take a – some men are just apathetic. They don't even realize that this, the importance of this or why it's important. Some men just have a really – high threshold for emotional pain. And mm-hmm. so they're not even aware that we've got to shift how we're, how we're living and working and leading and parenting. And um, some, some men, I think, they're, they come from the school of, you know, to be a man means show no weakness, show no emotions, show no kinks in the armor, because that's, that's not masculine. And that's where I think as women step up and they start leading more authentically. You've, you've probably heard of Sheryl Sandberg's book, Lean In. And I love that she got the conversation going. So she, her whole thing is women need to take a seat at the table. They need to lean in and they need to speak up. But where I say the next step from that is, yes, take a seat at the table and lean in, but change the language. Don't mm-hmm. continue doing it. Don't, don't find your confidence in and do it the same old way that it's always been done. So I think, I think it's about leveraging women in our strengths, but we've got to start engaging men in the process to help them understand. And I, um, when I did a workshop not too long at Google, I had a couple of guys come into this women's workshop that I did, and I loved it. They were young men, right? They were probably 30-ish, so the millennials, which was great. But they got it. They already understood, and they didn't see women as a, as a threat or a problem. Um, and, I'm, and so I think it's in, leverage women, but we've got to engage men in this process and help them understand that it's not a threat to them. And, and relieve that apathy towards it and understand why it's critical to heal and transform our world, our economic systems, our political systems, et cetera. Now, you describe in your book that transformation begins with learning to live from your core strength. Describe what that is exactly. So I think that, we again, it goes back to we're so geared to look outside of ourselves to be happy. And... We, we, we chase success, hoping that will make us happy. We chase the American dream. That will, you know, it's everything outside of us and just, or the man. When we find the perfect man or the perfect woman, we'll finally be satisfied and content and peace. And so I, it, when I say your core strengths, each of us have some, a gift. Each of us have a gift, a message, something that relieves suffering, adds joy to the world, and it doesn't have to be something big and grandiose. I think that's why a lot of people don't, don't follow their passion and their purpose because they think they have to go out and do something big and grandiose in the world. But it can be something as simple as, as if you, you have an artistic talent and you start cultivating that and sharing it with the world. So your core strengths are whatever lights you up, whatever allows you to flow, whatever you can't wait to get back and do again when you lose all sense of time when you're actually doing it. So it's it's a calling. It's your passion. It's, for me, I have no artistic ability. I have no musical ability at all. And I'm really, even though I spent over 20 years in the business world and technology world, my strengths weren't business acumen and technology. My strengths were the ability to cultivate great relationships and the ability to um, communicate and articulate effectively. Mm-hmm. and be a translator in large groups, right, where I could tell what this person didn't understand what this, the other person was saying and trying to communicate, and I could translate so the whole group could collaborate and get it. So that's my, that's my core strength. And so when you find that core strength, that's what you cultivate. And, when you li- and now I'm living from that. It took me until I was 50 years old to really figure that out, but now I'm living that. Now I'm living from my core strength, and that's to communicate and to support and educate women to find mm-hmm. theirs. You know, Lisa Marie, it's interesting that when we reach 50 years old, it seems, for a lot of us, that that's the time we really wake up and somehow we, we just get it. Yeah, <laughs> what does it, it take is. so long for? <laughs> you know, I you look know, at what I know now, and it's much like, you know, Peggy Sue got married. I wish I could <laughs> take this back to those days and, and, and use what I know now. <laughs> I don't know, Daniel. Why do you think it takes till around? I I don't know. I think it's probably you know for me personally that you begin to settle down and you realize that I didn't know everything that I thought I knew then. You know, yeah. 
yeah. we were desperately throwing up a front. I think it's we were basically exactly. faking it is mm-hmm. what it was until we made it. And the truth was is we really knew then what we know now. It's just we didn't really know nor did we have the confidence, especially for women, to apply it, you know, to authentically apply it, you know, and not to worry that we're going to be challenged, you know, and to keep continuously stepping forward in our authenticity. And and it's kind of sad sometimes to realize that you waste a lot of time. And it seems like you waste a lot of energy. But when you look back on all that turbulent time, you realize, you know, that really was necessary for me to feel the way that I do now. Exactly. And when you, I, I don't know, time is relevant if you really look at one lifetime in the, in the grand scheme of the universe, is you know, it's a speck in time, right? So if, whether right. it's 40 years or 50 years before you're waking up, but I think you, you said it, we have, there's a point in your 40s and 50s that you finally just settle in, right? And you finally stop, you don't have the energy any longer to put on pretenses and worry about what other people think. And when you get there, that's when you can really get in, get in touch with authenticity and what you what you really care about, because you're no longer, I think for a lot of people when they reach that 50-ish age, and it's, I'll say 45 to 55, there's a point where I don't have the energy for caring about the external things and what people want from me or what they think or, or trying to gain other people's approval. I'm going to live for me, mm-hmm. right? because suddenly there's also a realization, like my life is more than half over, mm-hmm. for sure, right? Mm-hmm. If I'm 50 years old, I'm probably not going to live to 100, so my life is somewhere over the halfway mark. And <laughs> when am I going to stop living for others? And I heard right. a survey just the other day, Daniel, about it was a hospice, a hospice worker, and she worked with people at their last few days of life and when they were in the hospice house. And she said the number one regret when, pe- when people are on their deathbeds is that they did not live their lives for themselves. Mm-hmm. They lived their lives for others' approvals, and for um, to please others. Well, you know, you got to take a look too, Lisa Marie, about how we came to this point. We've explored this many times on the program, sometimes in the most inadvertent ways. Whether it's been, you know, a Buddhist from Tibet, or it's been a Fortune 500 CEO who has said the very same things. And that is, you know, as you take a look at the industrialized nation and the creation of the education system. I think that's where we started learning a lot of these things. When you take a look before that time, you know, perhaps pre-industrial or even going back to even indigenous cultures, it really wasn't like that at all. In fact, you take a look at the Native Americans or Mm -hmm. Central and South American Native cultures. You know, Native cultures around the world, consistently you've seen extremely well-balanced culture men and women were equal in all the decisions and all the input, all of it. You know, of course, the women played their feminine roles, but again, the fact was, you know, that there was balance going on here and how we came to a point that the women seemed to be pushed aside. Your role is to support me while I go out there in the world and face those turbulent times to be sure that we have what we need. And, you know, I can imagine being a female, or at least trying to anyway, and realizing that's just not something I would really want to do. I can see the frustration of the rise of the feminist movement, you know, being kind of a necessary voice where one didn't exist. I, I totally agree. And, and I, in the tribal systems, yes, there, there's that. There's no difference between men and women. They just have their valuable roles. And in a lot of tribal systems, the, the woman is, is really honored even more so because she gives life. And, and so there's almost like a, um, a little bit of a pedestal for a lot of women in, in the tribal systems. I, I think that it goes back to we started harvesting the left brain only, in our, especially in, in mm-hmm. Western culture. We, we revere the intellect. We revere the credentials and the degrees. So, and it's all about the left brain, which is just your intellect. It's just your... You know, some people are, are gifted with more IQ than others, but the intellect is nothing more than a, a giant database of what you've learned and stored. And, and we've stopped fostering the whole being in that, you know, the, it goes back to your core strengths. That's your inner wisdom. Your greatest wisdom always comes from your heart, your whole body, not, not the intellect, not the linear, analytical, logical part of our brain. And so in our culture, we, 
and which men are naturally good at because they were the hunters, right? They're very linear. Their job is to go out and hunt and shoot and come back. <laughs> and and in, so I think that some of that has happened because we stopped, um, like in Eastern cultures and in Buddhism, we address the whole being. And that's part of what my training does because when I work with corporations, corporations spend huge amounts of time and money and investment in business acumen and what I'll call the hard skills, you know, learning more engineering skills, more business acumen skills. Those are more hard skills, but we don't focus on the soft skills, and that's emotional intelligence, all, all related mm -hmm. to emotional intelligence and connecting and relating to people and knowing how to tune into your, your deeper wisdom. And that's what I think is missing because you can't just harvest the left brain and expect to you know, we're, we're people at work. We're the same person at work as we are at home, so to speak. So if you're dysfunctional, you're dysfunctional at work. We have to look at addressing the whole being, not just their mind, so to mm -hmm. speak, their left brain. You know, and you take a look at today, and we're more of a creative ideas society, which I think is very encouraging, you know, because uh, a creative society is one that doesn't work from that left logical side that much. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I think that's very encouraging. For instance, when I go online, uh, YouTube is one of those areas. It's probably the second single biggest search engine that's out there. And one of the number one searches are people who are looking for people to show them how to do things. Yes. And there is nothing more exciting, and, and dare I say this to, to not be sexist, but it's pretty sexy to see a girl who can teach you how to do something that you think a man would be teaching you how to do. <laughs> and it's exciting That's at the nice. same time. And really, men pay attention to that. Now, they really want that. I don't know where the idea of the ultimate masculine power ever came, because I think a lot of guys just really never bought into that, but they felt they had to step into that role and realizing, you know, it's just so unnecessary. Well, I think... Um all right, I'm going to step out on a limb here, Daniel. We want you stepping out. We have people on our program <laughs> women, do that quite are, regularly. <laughs> we, we are just as intelligent as men. Right? Mm -hmm. but we are. There's a reason we call it Mother Earth, right? And no one ever argues it should be called Father Earth. And women can be, when they are really in their power, can, are really in their, in their core, really aligned and confident. I mean, we are powerful beyond belief because we can do everything a man can do intellectually, but we have a we have a different um, we have a different level of nurturing and collaboration and create you know we're about the greater good and creating impact. So there's if you look at the years of oppression of women throughout history and societies, I mean women have been brutalized, tortured, burned at the stake, and um, you know put in put in slavery and all of that you think about just here in the US right the witch burnings that went on for I don't know 300 years something like that and that was all because a woman was speaking her truth mm -hmm. she was all about mother earth she was all about um, her intuition and and we and men feared that saw them as witches and burned them at the stake so i mean we carry some of that in our as women and i think that's part of the confidence issue is for so long it was not safe to use our voice to defend ourselves legally, to defend ourselves physically. to, And so that's the confidence piece that we have to reignite in women because um, the world needs a whole lot of healing. Mm -hmm. You know, I kind of wonder, what are your thoughts about Oprah Winfrey? Well, I love Oprah um, in the sense of, I mean, look at, look at the amazing Look at the amazing things she's done and the voices that she's brought out and the education and the seeds that she's planted in so many people for, for others. So I think her work is, you know, her, her work is unbelievable because she's affected the masses and planted mm -hmm. seeds for something greater and something bigger and that we're all deserving of, of happiness and abundance. So I why just, do you ask? Yeah, I, I asked that because I felt the very same way you did. In fact, I was on my own personal journey in my mid-20s uh, for self-discovery. And at that particular time, her television show was a lot like a lot of the other, the dare I yeah. say, stupid shows at, at, at that time of the day. Yeah, of it was course. trash television. But eventually she began to she evolve evolved. a really unique voice. And I thought, you know, I started watching her myself because I thought, you know, what she's talking about here makes so much sense because I myself, I think a lot of people actually experience this in their 20s, is that idea that, 
you're going along and you're playing this role because it looks like it's what everybody wants you to do. Exactly. And you certainly were doing that yourself as you were having success in the corporate world. You were talking about that same thing. You were acting as if you were confident, in control, that you had everything that you needed. Like basically, people would look to you, Lisa Marie, and say, you know, she just seems to be somebody who always has it together, but you really didn't feel that way. That is a hard facade to continue. Eventually you have to say, you know, the hell with this. This is who I really am. Take it or leave it, but I'm moving in this direction because I can't live with myself anymore. (laughs) Yeah, and I don't know that it was really that. It wasn't a facade. I I enjoyed many parts of my corporate life, and I'm still very involved with um, Cisco Systems. I do consulting work for them. It's not, my heart's not in it anymore, and and it, it, but I couldn't be doing the work I'm doing now had I not spent all those years being groomed in corporate and understanding those systems and understanding what's going on with people there and that I, so I can go in and speak their language. Um, so it, that sort of gives me credibility. But I don't know that I ever felt like it was a facade. What I learned from that, and, and oftentimes I think girls that are brought up with a father, sometimes they take a patriarchal attitude on themselves. And I worked in a very male-dominated industry, and most of that was in the field, which is even more male-dominated. And I had an attitude of, I just, I'm going to bite off more than I can choose. If I want to go somewhere, I want to do something. And maybe I don't have all the credentials or all the answers, but that's okay. I'm going to just figure it out as I go, and I'm going to focus on what I can bring to the party, so to speak. And what I realize is most men do that, but most women don't do that. And then as I've launched into this over the last couple of years, I've realized there's study after study that proves that. And I'll just give you an example. So what I re- didn't realize is I was acting more like a man when it came to resilience and decisiveness. And I, you know, I can remember men over the years dating, they'd be like, my God, you're the most decisive woman I've ever met. And I didn't know that I was unique or that was um, – different than how most women behave. But I, I just, I read this survey or the study in HP. One in, they want more women to go for senior roles and they want more women to get promoted and they couldn't figure out why internally women weren't applying for positions for the next step up. And so this survey revealed that when a man looked at a position when it was posted, if he had 60% of the criteria for the job, he would, he would submit his resume and, and go for it. A woman would tell herself, I have to check off 100% of the boxes before I'm putting my hat in the arena for that role. So there's this, this competence versus confidence issue between men and women. And so I didn't have that. I acted more like a guy, but then as I moved into roles, I moved into my last three years, I was more in corporate global roles, so I was working with way more women in marketing and so forth. And I realized that most women don't do that at all. They do exactly what that HP study revealed. Hmm. That's fascinating. I know as I was reading your book that uh, one of the things that uh, there was a quote in there from your mother, and that was, right, wrong, do something. And yes. I really like that because this day and age, it seems, well, I think it actually has gone back for quite a while, that we make a decision, but yet we don't follow through on that. We start overthinking it is what you were we talking about at that time. And, you know, that's a pretty difficult place to live because then you end up finding out that you don't do, get anything done. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. And, I, you know, I, I really have to credit my mom for that one because she was, she was a pusher in that way. She was never – it wasn't about – you know, it was just to her staying stagnant and getting an analysis paralysis or, um, you know, overcomplicating things, whatever we do, it, to not take action and move forward into the unknown. To her, that was like a no-no, right? It's like it doesn't matter. Make a decision, move. Make, not making a decision is, is the worst decision anybody can make because you learn one way or another. Even if you make a wrong decision, you're going to learn something from that. So there's always a positive. Um, and we are so – it's funny because I'm, I'm a blogger on the Huffington Post, and I, you'll see this come out in the next week. I just wrapped finishing up a blog about the inner critic or the self-doubter within us versus our, our inner wisdom. And what I've really realized is we have a doubter, and, it's, and probably the best way to tell, explain this is to, to share a story, but the doubter is, is just there to make us risk adverse. And it's kind of like old, outdated DNA. It was the doubter that said it, it, it was there to keep us physically safe or to make sure we didn't get um, 
eliminated from the tribe, which meant we would die as well, because if we got pushed outside of a tribe, then we couldn't survive physically. And so the doubter, the inner critic is there. It's risk adverse, and it's there to keep us safe. But we don't have, you know, rarely is fear brought up for us because of physical harm today. So what we've done is we've made any type of taking risk, getting out of our box, moving into fear, moving into the unknown, and that we listen to that self-doubter automatically. And I'll give you an example. I, I was, um, this, wasn't, this wasn't even a year ago, and it was my first big keynote that I gave to a women's organization. And I had, been, I had started my business a year. My book wasn't quite, quite out. And it was in my industry, so it was a lot of upper managers and executives from the IT technology companies, so Microsoft, Cisco, Google, those type of companies. And I had a 40-minute keynote. And right before, and I was pre very prepared for this, and this was my first really big coming out type of keynote. And right before I got on stage, they had a women's power panel up there. So they had a moderator, and they had like four women that were all vice presidents at these huge Fortune 500 companies. And I, my little doubter came in. Right? I was like, oh my God, who are you to get up on stage after these fabulous, accomplished women? Like, you don't have anything to share for them. You're like nobody. Like, you are out of place there. You're so out of your league. And that's, that's what we do to ourselves. So like that little doubter was just chiming away at me, telling me I wasn't good enough. And, I, and what we have to do is like acknowledge that and go, mm, no, that's just my inner critic, not listening. And I had to go into my, into my inner wisdom and say, Lisa, you have a purpose and you have a place here and you have a message that every woman needs to hear and that's why you're here. And it doesn't matter what anybody's title is. Right? But we, we often, most people don't even realize they just immediately give in to that inner critic instead of quieting a little bit. It's like, okay, yeah, I hear you, blah, blah, blah. Let me, let me tune in to my deeper wisdom and what do I really know about me? Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting that you talk about that particular story of having to step up and be a keynote with people who before you were players that you didn't feel worthy to be in the same arena with. Yeah, yeah. I, I was, was there myself like almost 20 years ago as I began to embark in, in my thing, which is doing radio. <laughs> and I remember I would pass billboards that would show the newscaster mm -hmm. anchors, you know, and I'd yeah. look and I would think to myself, I'm not as good as those guys. You know, and I can see that a woman really has a more difficult time than I think that a man does because you're dealing with an extra set of obstacles besides that inner critic. Like, does a woman belong in this role? You know, these sort of things that you really battle with. Share some of those inner critics from a female perspective so our male listeners can get a better understanding of that extra obstacle that you tend to face. Well, I, I think because we see, we, as women, we see success was, a, by today's terms, was accomplished by this very masculine way. And we, we're not comfortable doing it a masculine way. It's not authentic to us, so we believe we don't have what it takes to be successful because we think that's the only path to success is to do it that way. And I'll, I'll give you an example of, of what I started to experience. So my last three years at, at Cisco, I was actually in the engineering organization, and I was in a product group um, for cloud services. And I actually, I'm not an engineer, and a, a technologist is not my forte. <laughs> but I was in that group because it was a startup, and I was about business development and creating community with partners and so forth. But long story short, I would sit at a table often in meetings, and I worked with engineers. And I mean brilliant engineers. Some of them had their masters from Harvard and Yale and um, MIT and Berkeley. So very intellectually um, intimidating, right? I certainly didn't have their type of IQ or brilliance, not in that arena. And I, I could myself doubt, would, I'm not like them. What am I doing here? How can I be successful? And how, what, do I even have any value being in this? And we can easily go into that inner critic with that. And then I, had to, I realized, like, you know what? I bring something to the table they don't, and I know how to connect to people, and I know how to relate what's happening in the marketplace and with customers and translate that for them so they can do the technology work that needs to happen to make mm -hmm. solutions that you know, aren't just great technology but actually serve the marketplace. And when I realized like, what your gift, Lisa, is your intelligence is emotional intelligence. Your intelligence is relationship and connecting to people. And I had to, but I had to, I had to consciously 
boost myself up through that because it's so easy to give into that and then just shut up and not realize your role. And another thing I realized really early on in my career, and this is what I encourage women to do all the time, because of that male dominance and that male way of doing things and that wasn't my way, I would often be in a meeting and I would have an idea, something that was unconventional, untraditional. It didn't come from data. It came from my own intuition. But I'd have an idea and I'd want to share it. And I knew that I was taking a risk of being judged or looked at as silly or um, not respected, so to speak, by, by saying it. But I would get this adrenaline rush of fear. That, mm-hmm. uh, and that became actually my cue that I had to speak it that if it gave me that much of an adrenaline rush of fear, it was absolutely something needed to be shared and needed to be said. And I got a lot of, well, you know, Lisa, where's the data behind that? I'm like, I don't have any data behind it. I just, it's a gut feel. I know it'll work. I think we need to try it. (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) And I think that's what's really fascinating about the female perspective or the feminine strength is the eye that you have an intuition and an instinct that really seems to be there as a, I guess, an extra muscle that men have, but we don't tend to develop it. We just figure courage should be enough. But intuition is that thing that really needs to be developed the most, that inner voice that you really need to pay attention to, uh, you know, to move in the direction of authenticity, to build all the other muscles, you know, in a, in a, I guess, a level of authenticity that's very unique. Yeah, and we all have, and the whole thing of it's it's not a men versus women thing at all. It's all about the masculine and feminine balance, which the world is way out of balance. It's it's run, it has been run from a very masculine patriarchal type of position. It's not working. It's clearly mm-hmm. not working. We've got to create balance, but the balance starts with within the individual. So there's sort of women have all of all of the, you know, there's some studies that I've been reading that you know the most desired traits or characteristics for the modern leader, eight out of ten of those characteristics are considered feminine today of what's really being called for, and they're the things that we've been talking about. But we all have to find that balance. And, and so here's where I come from is women already have all of this emotional intelligence, but they lack the confidence and the resiliency or the decisiveness to bring it and then we have men that have all, they're, they're all about taking action, but it's not coming from an inspired place. It's coming from a more of a linear and a competitive place. So do we teach women a little confidence to bring it, or is the shorter path to teach men all the emotional intelligence because they already know how to bring it? Well, obviously the shorter path is to teach women a little confidence and courage and the ability to take risk. And then when women <clears throat> do that, we free men up to start exploring that masculine-feminine balance within themselves. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm thinking of the television show, one that I enjoy watching, uh, my wife and I do, and that is The Apprentice. <laughs> but what always irked me about the show is that he divides the teams up into men and women. And it seems wow. that the women's team generally loses to a point that he finally has to mix them up. And I think, you know, it would be more enjoyable if you had mixed them up in the beginning because it's enjoyable to watch the process of teams work together, you know, when it comes to a co-ed situation, for lack of a better word. And, you know, and it's just why he does that in the first place, <laughs> you know, and then well, he divides them that yeah. way. Well, probably for the drama, right? right? But, <laughs> and to just get people, you know, irked and that gets them involved and keeps them hooked on the show. I mean, it's all about that, right? It's all about the drama and the socialism. Sure. But I... But that's but that's the bottom line. It's all about diversity. And and I was I was watching something a documentary recently on the Vietnam War, and and the Vietnam War went on ten years, and they there were peace talks, continuous peace talks going on through that entire ten years in Paris, and they showed a lot of footage from that and photos and so forth. And what I kept thinking when I looked at these photos of you know these hundred men surrounded around this huge round table, and I thought. Well, duh, there's no diversity <laughs> there. We've got a bunch of middle to, you know, late-aged white males yeah, exactly. who created the problem to begin with that are trying to solve it. Like if we had ten women sitting at that table, things... There, with there families, no less, family. and husbands in the war, yes. Exactly. Uh-huh. And that's, that's, it's, so it's not about anybody has greater strengths. It's about we have to have that diversity. You know, there's a great quote by Einstein, and I might, I, I might butcher it a little bit, but it's, his quote is that the, the, 
the thinking that created the problem is, is the same thinking that cannot solve that problem. Right. And that's what we have to realize. And, you know, actually this is kind of funny, So, and, and this works well in my tech industry, but there's actually, a, and I think it's because men haven't developed a lot of their feminine, and I think this will shift, but if you look at the left and right brain, and we know the left brain is the linear, analytical, logical, um, you know, it's, it's more just the intellect itself, the database. And the right brain is the creative, the intuitive, um, the feelings, the emotions, and so forth. And years ago, you know, in history, they were, the right and left brain were completely separate. There was, there, was no, there was nothing connecting them in the human brain. Well, today they're connected by one channel called the corpus callosum. And that's what allows you to move from left brain activity to right brain activity and to flow back and forth. Well, in a man today still physiologically, that channel is much more narrow than it is in a woman. So there really is a bandwidth issue. Right? Like you guys really sort of have a bandwidth issue, most men, when it comes to flowing between left and right brain. So an example of that would come out in, let's say a couple goes to a counseling session, a marriage counseling session. And you know, you're getting into some deep you know, emotional feelings, all of that stuff. Well, a woman most likely is processing real time as that's happening. A man literally will have to take a few days, go into his cave, and to process the, all of that emotion and feelings that, that you know, were stirred up or came up. And so, there, there, again, and, it, and it's not that anyone's greater or better, but I think part of the reason it's still smaller in a man is because he's been living so primarily in his left brain. And there's no absolutes here. Not all men are all women by any means. It's such a fascinating book. It's Wake Up Beauty. It's not about the prince. Now, one of the things you talk about that I think is very important for our listeners to know is that you uh, had many relationships that you began to discover were your greatest teachers and mirrors <laughs> of what you needed to know and to change, and it became sort of a quest for redemption. Tell us about that. Yeah, so that's my book is is interesting in that there's a lot of a lot of that story in there and and for me here I was in the world I was I was successful by all terms of our society's success and I was doing things in a man's world and I was making great money and um but on the the romantic side I was I had no power. I I was so desperate to have a man that I would pick men that really just weren't available emotionally that really weren't e- weren't even my equals on on you know intellectually emotionally spiritually financially and but it was my way of like but I was powerless in them and I would give my power away to stay in in a miserable relationship that wasn't serving me so I was this dichotomy right where I was I was very powerful out in the world in the business world but I was I had no boundaries when it came to the romantic relationship and that's hence the I didn't feel I was good enough unless I had a man and that was my journey, it was really my 15 years of kind of like 34 when I got divorced and my relationships that followed up until my late 40s that um, it, was a, it was a soul-searching journey to heal that and it started more with traditional therapy and then it moved into more spiritual um, type of awakening processes and yoga and different things to, to find my worth and to find my own passion and purpose. And, mm-hmm. and I realized that there were many powerful women in the world in the business realm, but weren't very powerful in their romantic relationships because they felt that they weren't okay unless they had a man. Because society tells us, what's wrong with you? You're, you're single. Well, God, what's wrong with her? There must be something wrong with him. He's still single. And it, there's a lot of pressure that we have to have somebody to be okay. And even my girlfriends, would they would get more excited about me telling them I had a date than telling them my book is going to be published. Oh, boy. <laughs> and, but we still see that, and, and it's so funny. I, I did a book signing just a couple of weeks ago at a Barnes & Noble, and I had three girlfriends come up to support me, and they were standing behind my table, and I was talking to one of the customers, and one of the women had just gotten engaged, and she had a giant diamond on her hand, and the other girls hadn't seen it yet, and they were just ooing and aahing over this diamond and her getting engaged, and like, oh, my God, you finally arrived, right? You find, found your holy grail, and and I know the relationship, and it's not even that what she truly, it's not even like, it's not even 90% of what she wants in a relationship as far as what's happening. She's, she's unhappy about a few things that are transpiring, mostly just he, doesn't, he won't pick a date to get married but, um, and, and to move into the same city and state. But interestingly enough, I'm like, you guys are behind me 
doing the opposite of my book right now. <laughs> what is this about? You're mm-hmm. oohing and aahing because somebody got engaged, and I'm signing a book called Wake Up Beauty. It's not about the prince. <laughs> but but do, you, do you see my point? We're so geared that we're right. not okay without a man. But gosh, when you find that man, like, oh, you've made it. So my book is a lot about my own, my own journey and healing that. And I really, I realized there were lots of women that had the same issue. There's a common humanity there, and men too. And I thought, you know what, if I can share my greatest aha moments in healing this misbelief about myself, then that's what I want to give to another woman. That's mm-hmm. my gift to the world. You talk about in your book that the woman of today is emerging as a feminista. Yeah, that's an interesting word. How did you come to create a word like that? Um, I actually can't take credit for it. I heard. Well, we're going to give you credit today. It doesn't matter <laughs> who it belongs to. I went to, to a conference <laughs> called Emerging Women Live, right. and the woman Chantal Pierre that uh, put the conference on, she was talking about how, and this is so true, the the term feminist has a ne- really negative connotation, right? Because it goes back to the '70s. She's about anger. The feminist is angry. She's about men versus women. It's about defensive posturing and, and demanding our rights. And we have equality today in the United States as women. I mean, do we need a few policy changes still? Yeah, absolutely. But for the most part, we're empowered and we have equal rights in the U.S. and Western culture as women. And she was, she was the word feminista. She's like, I like the word feminista because, you know, the, the modern feminist, she's about, she's about the divine feminine. She's about sensuality. She's about healing. She's about transforming the world. Um, and so feminista, you know, is just a better, I, I, I want to get away from the term feminist because it's very negative. Mm-hmm. Even my son, who was probably 20 at the time when I first, he was 19, maybe launched my website, and he was very proud of his mom, right? He was showing it to different friends, parents, and so forth. And he's like, yeah, Mom, I showed your website to so-and-so. And his his dad was like, wow, your mom's a total feminist. <laughs> <laughs> wow. He, and he and and he was like a little embarrassed by that. Even my son at 19 knew that there was something negative about being quote a feminist and you know my attitude was like yeah and the problem with that is <laughs> but you know but, I'd like you if you could to describe what your relationship with your son was like when it came to talking about such things. Um he's He's interesting. He he totally, you know, at his core, at his root, he totally understands and he gets it and he doesn't have issues between men and women or seeing women as less in any way. I mean, he's a millennial, but he loves he loves to play the the role and he loves to get my goat and make little jokes as if, you know, women are less than or submissive, but it's all in fun. Which even tells me because he makes fun of it, he truly gets it. Yeah, because I know when I pulled that once in a while, just like your son did, well, my mother was usually holding a black iron skillet after she came home from work. She <laughs> says, I think it's about time that you put your hands on this, keep your mouth shut, and cook the family dinner. How about that? <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> but, you know, here's a fascinating thing. You talk about today's world, that it really is equal, and it, and it truly is. In, and, in the Western culture. Yeah, well, in the Western culture, definitely, but... And and wonderful proof of this is that I served in the 1980s. I served in the United States Navy. Mm -hmm. Back in that time, women were on board ships. However, they could only be or they were only uh, on ships that didn't have any weaponry. Ah. There was a single gun on that boat. You didn't see a female who was assigned to that ship. Okay, so I think it was about seven or eight years ago, give or take, I came across a documentary that fascinated me, a a wonderful documentary, actually. It's called Carrier. And this is a documentary. It's a 10-part series on the USS Nimitz as it steams toward the Persian Gulf, of course, you know, for the war in Iraq and what's going on in the Middle East. What's astounding was is it was a co-ed ship. One-third of the crew were females. Mm -hmm. Now, the USS Nimitz is the world's most powerful war machine. This is a nuclear aircraft carrier. Okay. Even more astounding was the fact that some of the fighter pilots were women. Yeah. And I looked at that, and I was just like, it's about time, because, you know, they're saying, look, if they can do the job, they get it. It's just that simple. And I think it's just uh, it was, for me, such a liberating thing, and, and this is a male speaking, to see that women could actually step up, and, and you see them, in fact, uh, last summer I was having a little fire out in my front yard, you know, just a nice little fire. Apparently a neighbor got upset, decided to call the fire department, and one of the people was a woman. 
she was a fireman. And I was like, it, it's just so neat to see that happen, to realize that we're out of that old stone industrial aged way of thinking where the woman stays at home and keeps her mouth shut and keeps yeah. the man happy. And, and really, I think a lot of men more often really like that more than, than I think women realize. I think that there's, there's kind of two perspectives on that, and, and you might be a little surprised by mine. And, and I was engaged with somebody that was a Special Forces Blackhawk pilot, and he was also a flight instructor, so he dealt with some women. And, what, and he's, he's very pro-women, so it wasn't that. But I see what I'm seeing happening a little bit in that arena um, is there's a sort of affirmative action thing happening where we're lowering the standards sometimes to accommodate women or like I just, I just saw an article in Germany where they've made it law that all corporate boards of, have to have, you know, publicly traded companies within Germany have to have 30% of their boards represented by women. And what concerns me about those things, and I know that in the, in the, to be, be a fireman, they lowered the standards of what you could carry and so forth for a woman to pass the physical test of that. And I don't agree with that. I mean, if, if the job requires you to be able to do X, Y, Z, then whether you're a man or woman, you should be able to do X, Y, Z. So right. I do get a little concerned that we, we lower standards to, to make, create women's equality in that. that because then, then it doesn't become about the right person for the job. It becomes about you have to put a woman in there because we're required to have so many women. Right. And I don't want to see that happen either. No, no, of course but not. But I do think, I mean, and I've met some fabulous women that are in very not, you know, that have been traditionally male-dominated or very physical male type of, um, type of roles, but I remember I remember a story, and this kind of speaks to my, the, my fiance at the time. That was the Black Hawk pilot instructor, and he was training a very decorated woman um, in the army, and she was a West Point graduate, and so far, but she was not passing his test to to get her certifications for the pilot on the Black Hawk. Right? She was not, and he was not going to he was not going to pass her. But he kept getting continuous pressure because of who she was and that she was a woman from his higher-ups to go ahead and just check the box. And so I do have an issue when that happens. Sure. But I'm not taking anything away from the amazing accomplishments for these women that are trailblazers. And I saw something recently about the first, the first woman's class at West Point back in the, in the, I think it was like 76 or something. But, I mean, those are women that are trailblazers and more power to them, like to, to go in there and have to deal with that adversity and, um, to do that, absolutely, it's huge, and it's 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 cool when you're seeing that more and more in the sciences and in the tech field as well. Mm -hmm. um, but it's still it's because they have to deal with all of that prejudice. Mm -hmm. But I also don't want to see standards change to accommodate to make more of it happen either. Well, and even more fascinating, since we were on the subject of the United States military, as you go back to World War II, and there was a special group of women known as Fly Girls. Are you familiar with them? Yeah, absolutely. You know, and I thought that was such a cool story because there were people of courage right there because they were mostly test pilots for the newer planes that were coming out. <laughs> and I thought, you know, there ain't no lowering of a standard there. Either the plane's going to fly or it's yeah. not. That's just as simple as that. But I totally resonate with what you're talking about, how there is that potential to lower the standard because all of a sudden now – it's politically correct to have the right ratios. You know, you see the yeah. same thing in, in race, you know, for instance, in Hollywood, you know, that, well, you know, the new standard now, according to Hollywood unions, if you will, is there has to be a certain percentage of blacks in shows and movies. And, you know, so you kind of wonder, are we ever going to get to that point where we don't have to be politically correct, but it's really about who is the best person for the role or the job you know, that sort of a thing. Do you and think Daniel, we'll ever get that, there? Yeah, but that's exactly what the whole masculine-feminine balance is about. Right. Right? And so, you know, the pendulum always has to swing to the other, you know, to the severe other side before it finally settles in the middle. And that's kind of where we are right now. You know, we're, we're still swinging a little bit further out before we find that balance point. And, but all of this is initiating finding that because, yeah, when we really get to where we're all about it's a masculine and feminine balance within individuals, within organizations, within companies, you know, political systems, et cetera, then that's, that will do away with all of that. But right now we're still, we're still sort of fighting for that, that right, so to speak. But I love there's a quote by um, Dalai Lama, and it was from the 2009 World Peace Summit in Vancouver, and he said, the world will be saved by the Western woman. 
And it's, it's because we are empowered as women already here in the U.S. We have equality. And, yeah, there's some policy changes that need to happen as far as family leave and disparity in pay and things like that. But overall, I mean, if, if, if you're not empowered as a woman in the U.S., it's because you haven't, you haven't stepped into that for mm-hmm. yourself and, and claimed it. But there's so many women in other parts of the world that can't speak for themselves, and it's not safe to speak for themselves. So I think that, you know, the power of the Internet now brings all of these stories to us and throughout the world, and I think it's, it's sort of our job as Western women. It's sort of our responsibility, and I talk about this in my book, to, to lead this way. And the other thing you talk about, too, is uh, encouraging women especially to let go of their fear. And I really love the quote that you have in there by, I believe it was Brendan Burchard, which is, Uh unless you are being chased by an animal, fear is just bad management of your mind. Yeah, and it goes exactly back (laughs) to that doubter, right? Because that's why we have the fear was meant to keep us physically safe. and we right. It's outdated DNA, and that's all it is. And so because we don't live in a world where our physical safety is really at stake on a day-to-day basis, um, there's no animals chasing us. There's, you know, there's no risk of starvation in the, you know, for the most part and things like that. And we've, we've now turned that into just expanding out of our comfort zone. So anything that takes us out of our box, right, our little comfort zone that brings up fear, our inner critic, chimes in and tells us not to do it, we can't do that. So, yeah, it's about, it's about what I was just talking about. You, you quiet the doubter, the inner critic, so that your inner wisdom can speak up. Because there's no growth or creativity without expansion. And there's no expansion without getting uncomfortable and getting out of your box and moving into the unknown. And I think that's why people have trouble making decisions, because they, they're afraid to move into the unknown. Mm-hmm. That or we're always taught that we have to have the right conditions before we make a decision or things have to just be perfect before we make a decision. All of our ducks have to be in a row before we make a decision. The fact is, forget about the ducks, just make a decision, like your mother said. Well, yeah, but (laughs) I've learned that. I can't even tell you I've learned so much about that in the last two years in starting my own business because I didn't have it all laid out. And it's transitioned and transformed, and my direction has changed, and it's just it's literally been one step in front of the other, and then the next the next place to go has revealed itself. But I I certainly I certainly had an idea and a strategy laid out when I started, but it's shifted and changed since then. Mm-hmm. And we are where I, I see so many women, especially I'm so tired of hearing women not have the confidence, and they've got a great book to write, they've great, got a great business idea, they've got a great organizational idea, they've got a great volunteer idea, they have you know uh, some some sort of something message, some gift they're meant to share with the world, and they let their doubter and their fear, and they believe they have to have it all mapped out, all perfectly laid out before perfectionism, before they can take a step. And, and it doesn't work that way. It's sort of like following the yellow brick road. You know, it's just one, the next step doesn't get revealed to you until you're pretty close to it. Mm-hmm. And that's about faith and trust. And I know that's, that's been a huge lesson for me over the last two years. And every time I just said, Lisa, what have you done? Just quit this and go back and get a corporate job and you'll be safe. Mm -hmm. Every time I've been close to that, something amazing happens. And Um, and it's like, nope, keep going. (laughs) You know, it's funny because just before, uh, as this particular segment was being presented to me uh, with your book and this particular show, is I had that jingle from the 1970s, and I'm sure you'll remember this. Um, I can bring home the bacon, fry it up in a pan, and never, never let you forget you're a man. Mm-hmm. And oh, of course. Do you remember that one? Oh, and yeah. I think it had to do with, I can't even remember what the, the it was the, uh, a product, but uh, obviously. But what was funny is I was just kind of ruminating over that for a while, and I started thinking, well, if she can do all that, then what the hell is a man for? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, but, exa- but you know what? One of the, and we've done that, right? Right. And, and what's limiting women right now because of that exact thing, and, and I see this in, in – in the business world all the time where a man and a woman both have very demanding careers, they have children, they have a home, and the woman is still taking care of the majority of right. the domestic and the child rearing and the decisions that revolve around that. And, and so what's happened is it's kept women kind of playing small because they're so others focused, they don't have the time or energy to tune into themselves and their own calling, their own passion and their own worth. So we've got to start seeing a shift where now men start, there's more balance in those domestic roles between men and women. 
so that women can continue to ex- excel as well. And mm-hmm. um, I think that's and, – and there's women have a way of thinking they're the only ones that can do it right. I'm the only one that can bathe the kids right and get them in the right pajamas and dress them for school properly and make – you know. So there's women have to let go of maybe the guy's not going to do it your way, your mm-hmm. husband's not going to do it exactly how you would do it, but just be grateful he's doing it mm-hmm. and accept that he's going to do it differently and that's okay. But that's where I see a big shift. Has to, women have to start – allowing men to play a bigger role in that and accepting they're going to do it differently and that's okay. Mm-hmm. Such an exciting conversation. It's one certainly we could go on, but, <laughs> you know, uh, the book is Wake Up Beauty. It's not about the prince. Our guest today, Lisa Marie Jenkins. Lisa, is there a website people can find out more? Yes, lisamariejenkins.com. And you can, um, I offer coaching, I do consulting and speaking, and then also I, I blog regularly on the Huffington Post. Very good. Lisa Marie, thanks for joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program. What a pleasure. Thank you, Daniel. It was fun. We want to thank you, the listeners out there, for tuning in. Again, the book is Wake Up Beauty, and you can find out more by visiting the website, which is Lisa Marie Jenkins, or excuse me, Lisa Marie Jenkins.com. I'm Daniel Davis. Thank you for tuning in. This is the Beyond 50 radio program, and remember, live your day past halfway. Thank you.